Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Imagery and Official Statistics webinar, the second webinar in the Making Census 2020 Count with GIS webinar series. My name is Richie Ibarra, and I'm a marketing specialist here at Esri, and I will be your moderator today. This webinar is being recorded. We will send you an email afterwards to point you towards the recording if you'd like to view it again or share it with your colleagues. There will be a Q&A section at the end of the webinar. You can type your questions into the questions window, and we will address them at the appropriate time. There will also be poll questions to give you the opportunity to interactively respond to questions and see the collective results. Note, individual results will not be published, just a percent response to each poll question. I'll now turn the webinar over to Mark to introduce our speakers. Mark? Thank you, Richard. Hi, I'm Mark Seigen, and I'm the Mapping and Statistics Industry Manager at Esri. I've been working in GIS and mapping for, for 34 years. I'm also actively participating on the United Nations Committee of Experts on Global Geospatial Information Management, also known as the UN GGIM. Mark? Thanks, Mark. Um, my name is Mark Romero. I've been with Esri for 13 years um, in uh, many different roles, uh, most recently on the imagery team as a solutions engineer. And really what I do is focus on all aspects of our software that have to do uh, with imagery or anything coming off a sensor and uh, from the technical side of things. And really just here to help um, customers um, guide through the software and uh, navigate the ins and outs of working with imagery. Uh, Linda? Thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. Linda Peters here. Uh, really pleased to join you today. I am a business development manager here at Esri focused on official statistics. I work with national statistical offices across the globe, helping them understand how to apply GIS and spatial thinking to census and statistical activities. I am an active member of UNGGIM expert group on the integration of statistical and geospatial information as well as the big data and national reporting platforms. Um, Mark, you want to kick us off? Yeah, well, thank you everyone. Today we're going to talk about the importance of imagery in official statistics. I'm going to use the term imagery broadly to include not only imagery, but many types of remotely sensed data, including LIDAR. Although this is a pretty broad definition for imagery, it'll expedite my descriptions throughout the webinar. Imagery can be used uh, throughout most of the census processes, but we're going to focus on the planning and pre-enumeration phase in this webinar. And we'll explore the uses of imagery for creating and validating enumeration areas and base map updates. We're also going to look at two use cases along with some demos. One on identifying building locations using imagery, and the other on automated building feature extraction using LIDAR. This webinar will support three important goals of national statistical offices. Delivering high quality official statistics in a timely manner to better support decision making in our countries, modernizing our operations, and creating efficiencies throughout our organizations. Some of the benefits of imagery are the ability to identify new buildings where people are located for census planning and enumeration. Also optimizing resources by decreasing the areas field staff need to visit to do things like address canvassing. These activities will increase the quality of your census data by accurately and efficiently identifying where the people are that you're counting. Imagery is used by national statistical offices to improve workflows and efficiencies both in the office and in the field. It's used in a number of key activities, including uh, visualization of imagery used across many statistical business processes in imagery base maps for planning and enumeration operations, for change detection, indicating areas with change in order to optimize where, the most, where to most effectively focus your resources, um, updating your base maps and features, using imagery to identify new buildings. We'll be concentrating on this in the, in the webinar today. And finally, imagery is used for agricultural and natural resource analysis and assessment, mapping these areas for their economic potential. ArcGIS provides the ability to do image processing and analysis for visualization, change detection, uh, image classification, and feature extraction. ArcGIS also has imagery analyst tools and the ability to sequence these tools in tasks and models. We use these to create automated workflows for processes like change detection. 
In this example, we see change detection using NDVI, or Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. It's used to determine the areas of change from, say, vegetation seen in the image on the left to a built environment in the image in the center to the areas of change detected, indicated in, in red on the image on the right. Another example of change detection comes from the United States Census Bureau. They're doing change detection by comparing baseline imagery from the 2010 census to current imagery to identify areas of change. The Census Bureau staff is identifying these areas of change and marking those areas so they can send their field staff out to canvas new buildings to be able to count those people in the census. However, they're also eliminating large areas that do not have change, therefore saving significant amounts of time and money by not having to send field canvassers out in the field. This example in Providence County, Rhode Island, illustrates the vast amount of areas in green that were resolved as not having changes using imagery by staff in-house. This significantly narrowed down the areas with change, shown in yellow, and enabled the Census Bureau to minimize the field canvassing staff needing to be sent out. As we look at the generic statistical business process model used by many official statistical offices, we're going to talk about the use of imagery in the planning and pre-enumeration phases, which are on the left. Within the planning pre-enumeration phase, we'll look at two examples today. On the le left, we'll look at image classification used to identify features, including building locations. And on the right, we see two images of buildings extracted from LIDAR. In the planning and pre-enumeration phase, organizations often use imagery and ESRI's ArcGIS technology for a number of processes. These include creating accurate enumeration-based maps, identifying areas of change from the last census, updating building infrastructure information, extracting building footprints, and revising the extent of enumeration areas. The ArcGIS platform can help you transition to more modern statistical workflows. Services are key, especially image services and map services for your geodatabase. Providing access to all your users via apps and maps on the device of their choosing. Imagery is key to visualization, and ArcGIS enables visualization across your organization on any device, which in turn will improve the quality of your census enumeration data. Now let's look at the first of our use cases, identifying buildings using imagery. Understanding imagery characteristics will help you apply the right imagery to the statistical business process you're working on. Image resolution is the first important consideration to ensure you can identify the objects in the image, like structures or areas. For example, in urban areas, you would want sub-meter resolution in order to accurately identify objects. Also accuracy, ensuring multiple images align geographically with each other so things like change detection can be performed. Next, spectral resolution, which is identifying the number and types of spectral bands needed. For example, putting together bands for true color or false color or other band combinations. The examples on the right show different spectral signatures using these band combinations. And finally, elevation data. Sources like LIDAR can be used for elevation and extraction of building footprints. I'm gonna show you how you can identify new buildings using imagery in your office before ever sending your staff into the field. Using imagery analysis and processing, you can automatically identify the roofs of buildings from multispectral imagery. This will allow us to understand the location of buildings and roof materials to help optimize the delineation of enumeration areas. In this case, it's 10 roofs that are being identified. And we use object-oriented feature extraction to bring these building features into our geodatabase. An image classification workflow can be set up with ArcGIS, which gives you the capability of exploring and analyzing your imagery, and then selecting the spectral bands needed to identify building features, and cla then classifying the imagery for building feature extraction using the image classification wizard in ArcGIS. Here are some of the ArcGIS imagery tools that can be used in the imagery uh, analysis process. For example, the spectral profiles can be seen in the lower right. 
and a spectral uh, scatter plot in the in the upper left. My colleague Mark Romero is going to demonstrate some of the capabilities I've been describing. Mark? Okay, thanks, Mark. I'm going to switch over the screen. And can you see it, Mark? Yes. Okay, thanks. So this is um, ArcGIS Pro, and what you're looking at is a WorldView 3 satellite image from Digital Globe. Uh, this is in, a, in an area in, um, in Mozambique. And uh, we're displaying this in our uh, desktop uh, GIS application. We call this ArcGIS Pro. This is both a desktop GIS application as well as an image analyst analysis workstation. And so for this particular demo, uh, we're going to use this image to uh, do, perform an image classification process so we can extract out the tin roofs. And uh, where my cursor is, um, is the location of some of these tin roof uh, building materials. In another process, we'll, we'll show how we can also um, use the pen sharpen image to extract out the roofs that contain uh, more of the natural material uh, rooftop. So to aid in the image classification process, within Pro there's actually a variety of uh, image processing tools that are available. And these are everything from anal analytical tools such as uh, thresholding. Uh, we can also um, use a variety of the classification tools. And for this demo, we're going to use an object-oriented uh, feature extraction uh, workflow where we actually segment uh, the satellite image. Uh, there's also a lot of other image processing tools that you know aid in this type of workflow. Um, here's another one, apparent reflectance, which um, eliminates all of the atmospheric um, issues that you may uh, encounter when you're working with satellite imagery. And as I go down the list, you can just see there's a variety of these image processing tools. And a lot of these we won't have time to demo today, but these are all available uh, out of the box in Pro. Another uh, important process in um, in the classification workflow is simply uh, having a good tool for visualization. And so within Pro, um, one of the things that we can do is work with different windows and different data um, to do a visual interpretation of the imagery itself. So on the right panel, I've got the pan sharpen image. This is the same image. And then, um, sorry, on the left, I have the pan sharpen image. On the right, I have the eight band image um, displayed as false color. And so I have the two screens um, linked together, both in scale and it's in position. And so this is a great tool just initially to go in and interpret the imagery and just get a sense of the different band combinations and so forth. And so here's an example um, where we can easily see the tin roof um, on both the multi-spectral and the pen sharpen. But then this material with the natural roof type um, can be seen in the pan sharpen, but you can see it starts to blend in with the natural surroundings of, of you know, the exposed dirt um, in the in the multispectral image. And so this is really what we want to do in the first step is just get a sense of uh, the type of data that we're working with. Another um, aspect of image interpretation is really just working with the different band combinations. And so with this particular image from Digital Globe contains eight bands. And at the moment, we're just displaying it as a false color uh, composite. But I can easily go and select the image and start working with the different band combinations uh, with one button. So as I uh, change the band combination, I can see what sort of features are um, are more prevalent in this particular band combination. I can choose different ones. And at this point, I'm just trying to find the right band combination that I think would be appropriate for extracting out these tin roofs. So here's a good one. Uh, the only one, the only problem I see with this is that it doesn't uh, distinguish the bare earth from the vegetation features. So I might wanna continue to look for a different band combination. So here's one that, that I've settled on, and you can see that the tin roofs um, pop out. They're shown in yellow. The vegetation, in this case, is shown in these shades of blue. And then 
the bare earth or exposed dirt is shown in uh, these shades of purple. And so this is from the visual eye, a nice band combination. I think I could get a good result from here. This is just what my eye is telling me. I also want to quantitatively, quanti quantitatively uh, look at the pixel values and see how much separation is actually happening in here. So one of the tools that Mark showed uh, in his slide is, um, is some charts and graphs that allow us to, to visualize that. And one of them I have here is uh, simply a spectral profile. And this lets me look at the spectral curve or sort of each man-made feature and natural feature on the earth has its own unique spectral profile. And what these lines represent are those particular spectral profiles for each of the categories that I'm interested in. So I can actually turn these off and you know, interrogate each one of these. So this black line here is actually one of the tin roof spectral profiles. So what we, we can see is that in band one, it's got a very high reflectance value. And then maybe on the other side, uh, over here, band eight on the far right, we've got a very low spectral response. So as we start to plot um, other types of materials, there's another tin roof. Um, here's two types of vegetation. You can see that they all each have their own unique spectral uh, response and spectral curve. And what we're trying to do and we're trying to accomplish with this is we're trying to find as much separation or variability between uh, the different features. So if I look at my profile here, I can see maybe band two's got um, a lot of separation. Band eight definitely has a lot of separation between the features and then maybe band five. So using that band combination uh, that I chose and then comparing that to the spectral profile, that confirms that that band combination might be a good, uh, a good choice when we begin our classification process. So if I wanted to actually go in and plot my own, I can uh, click a button here and um, we'll go into one of the building footprints with um, the more natural material. And I'll just draw a, a circle around that so that encompasses and looks at all the pixels within that circle. And then I can go back and now I see this new curve that represents, um, in this case, the, um, the building footprint with the natural root type. So you can see that this has its own unique uh, spectral response, somewhat similar to the exposed dirt. And that's why this one uh, makes it a little more challenging than the tin roofs, which is, um, you know, it's way up here. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and go back. And now that I've, uh, chosen my uh, product that I want to use, I can begin the classification process. So within um, ArcGIS Pro, um, we simply select the image that we're interested in classifying. And there is a dedicated imagery tab, and we click this button here, it's called the classification wizard. This is a user interface that walks through every step of classifying uh, the image. It is wizard-based, and you simply um, enter the inputs and then click next, 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 and it'll walk you through the process. So this is the initial uh, panel. And so I can decide if I wanna do supervised or unsupervised. I can choose to pixel-based or object-based. I'll choose object-based. I've already input a classification schema and I've already performed the segmentation and some of the training samples for the sake of time. So I'll just walk through the first couple steps just so you guys get a sense of um, what this is like. So I've hit next, and now I've come to the step, uh, step three, where I can start collecting training samples. Uh, you can see I've already collected some vegetation, some bare earth, and some building footprints of the tin roofs, and then I can hit next from there. Uh, here is where I'll um, decide what classifier I wanna use. And so we support a variety of the uh, most popular uh, deep learning uh, classifiers, including maximum likelihood, random trees, and support vector machine. And I can continue through the process and just hit next, 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 and that just goes on to the next step. So you can see it's a very easy um, visual uh, wizard that lets us go through that 
process, which um, at times can be uh, very complex. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on uh, just the results. So here's my initial classification layer. I've got my metal roofs in uh, these dark shades of, of, of gray, my vegetation in green, and then anything else that's not that is is other. So I'll turn off my, um, my other, I'll go ahead and turn off my uh, vegetation, and then I'll change the color of my rooftops to, let's say, a magenta. And then what I'll do is go ahead and turn off the multispectral, turn on the pan sharpen, I'll zoom out, and this gives us a sense of running through that classification workflow and extracting out the, uh, the tin roofs. And so I can just check that on and off. And you can see it did a fairly good job of pulling those tin roofs out. Now, um, to extract out the, uh, the rooftops with the more natural uh, material, we would want to go through that process one more time. Um, but the second time around, collecting different training samples um, and using the, uh, the pan sharpen image instead. And so I'll go ahead and just turn on the results here. Here's the segmented image. You can see it uh, pulled out all these different features. And then um, finally, here's the classified results. So the red um, pixels represent the natural thatched roof building footprint, and the blue ones represent the tin roofs. And there you go. And really, from there, it's uh, mostly just QA, QC. So we can take that result and actually uh, convert those to vectors and generate um, a generalized building footprint layer uh, from the result. Um, so that is image classification in ArcGIS Pro, as fast as I can uh, demo this. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Mark. OK, thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. And um, we're going to uh, pause here for a minute and ask you to take a poll question. It'll give you a chance to give us uh, some feedback. Uh, so the poll question you'll see on your screen there is, is, organization using, uh, is your organization using imagery today? And you can select any of the boxes uh, that apply. Just pick the boxes that apply. Um, it could be visualization using imagery as a backdrop. Uh, maybe using it for change detection analysis or feature extraction. Uh, could be agriculture and natural resource assessment. Some of you may not currently be using any of these or, or you're not sure, that's fine, just indicate that. Um, it looks like we're getting quite a few uh, responses here. It looks like about um, uh, close to half of you have responded. So we'll give you a few more seconds for the rest of you to kind of just tick the boxes there. And uh, right now, it looks like uh, visualization is, uh, is definitely the top one. Uh, we'll give you another second here. Just go ahead and tick those. And then we're going to close, um, uh, close out the poll. Looks like about 2 thirds of you have responded. So thank you for that. And again, visualization uh, looks like 2, two thirds of you, about 67%, are using visualization, using imagery as a backdrop. Um, about a third of you are not uh, currently using, or you're not sure what you're using. About a quarter of you are using it for change detection analysis, so that, that's great. And almost another quarter of you using it for feature extraction. So uh, pretty significant there. Uh, about 15% are using it for agricultural and natural resource assessment. So thanks for your input on that, your feedback. I think that's, uh, I think that's great. And um, we're going to move to the, um, the second use case, and we're going to look at is identifying new buildings using LiDAR. And LiDAR is increasingly being used to identify uh, new features such as buildings and automatically extracting them into your geodatabase. Many nations are already collecting LiDAR over their countries for many different purposes, and official statistical offices can often access and use these data. Looking at a few of the basic concepts of LiDAR will help us understand how we can use it for automated feature um, extraction. LIDAR is an acronym for light detection and ranging. And with LIDAR, there are laser light pulses that are sent from the sensor, and the return rates are measured to calculate heights of features on the ground. Here we're illustrating two types of elevation data derived from the LIDAR. The, on the left is the digital surface model, or the DSM, which is created from the first returns of the LIDAR point. And on the right, the digital terrain model, or DTM, also known as bare earth, comes from the last returns of the LIDAR points. Let's see why this is important. First, we start with the raw LIDAR point cloud data. 
ArcGIS provides tasks with a tool to create digital surface models or DSMs from the first returns of the LIDAR points. ArcGIS also is used to create the digital terrain model from the last returns of the, of the uh, LIDAR points. Then we create a draft of the building footprints derived from the digital surface model and the digital terrain model. And then by cleaning and removing artifacts, we finalize the building footprints. So that's sort of the workflow flow here. And my colleague Mark is going to demonstrate uh, how this is done. Mark? OK, thanks. Can you see my screen, Mark? Yes. OK, so I'm going to step through um, the workflow that Mark just described in his slides, um, again, using ArcGIS Pro and show the different uh, workflows and uh, through different types of data that, uh, that you may have. And so um, oftentimes when uh, you get LiDAR data, it comes as, as what we just call raw, raw LiDAR data, meaning it's, meaning it's unclassified. And uh, within ArcGIS Pro, we can actually change these different renders to show what kind of data we, we are working with. So if I uh, go to the Appearance tab um, and hit the Symbology, I can quickly switch between these raw classified points to view just the elevation values. I can also see the, the first return, the last return, and all the other points in between. And then we can all also look at the intensity of, um, of the response from the ground to the sensor. But what we want to focus on here is uh, the classification. So the, the ASPRS uh, last spec has a, um, a set of classes for each type of point that you can go in and classify. Um, ours are at the moment classified as value of zero, which means they've never been classified. And so this is pretty common uh, deliverable from uh, from vendors to a customer to be able to to get to deliver this type of uh, unclassified data. And so we recognize that as a problem for many of our users. So we established a couple of different workflows for extracting building footprints from unclassified uh, point clouds. And so the workflow that I'm about to describe and that Mark went through in his slides are a series of steps one through six uh, tools that you have to run to be able to generate these different types of um, products. And so for the sake of time, I'm not going to click through each one of the tools, um, but I'll show you the results. And so the first step really involves taking your point cloud and converting that to um, a DSM and a DTM. And so what you're looking at now is uh, the DSM, which shows uh, the ground as well as all the terrain, including the uh, uh, the vegetation and the buildings. And so if we perform a swipe against the DTM, we can now see as close as possible just the ground surface. And so these two layers themselves are very important in this workflow in that they um, are the inputs into doing the mathematical um, uh, basically the map algebra of subtracting the two from each other, which provides a lot of information, including uh, building height, um, canopy height of the vegetation, and so forth. And we also use that as a way to extract out the building footprints. So those are two very important inputs. I'll go ahead and uh, go back down to the point cloud. And then from there, um, as we go through the steps of the models, we can then start to generate some of these different products. And so the first product is um, this DTM DTM composite, which sort of you can start to now start to see the building footprint outlines. Uh, but there's also some other stuff that it might pick up, like um, some vegetation. And so through the series of steps, we, we go in and eliminate some of the noise. And then from there, we can generate uh, what we call the draft polygons. And if I zoom in, you can see that those extent of those polygons are following 
uh, the extent of the pixels, which is not a very accurate representation of the building footprint. But as we go through the model, we can start to refine that a little bit more. And then what we end up getting is more of a generalized footprint layer uh, that closely follows along um, the outer extent of the building. So all this is possible out of the box without any need for uh, classified LIDAR data. We can simply go through these tools and, and get what we think is a, a nice representation of the building footprints. So that is the workflow for generating building footprints if you have unclassified uh, data. Um, so with that, we also provide tools for classifying the data yourself. And so we also recognize that um, it is important to have classified LiDAR data uh, from any other aspects of working with LiDAR. And so within Pro, there's a full uh, set of tools for actually classifying the data. So I'll just show one example. So I've got my point cloud, my raw point cloud uh, selected here. There's a dedicated classification uh, tab and I can click the tools that I, um, the drop down that uh, show me where the classification uh, tools are. And these are ordered in the way that you would want to run them. So the first step would be in this case to classify the ground. So I can click that tool and then click the run button and that'll process um, and look at all the points in my data set and try to determine of those points which ones uh, represent the ground surface. So that's taken into consideration a variety of things, including the first return, the last return, and um, how high or low the points actually sit themselves. All right, so that's completed uh, the first run. So you, I now have uh, all the points that are in shades or the color brown uh, represent a ground surface. So I could continue to go through the rest of the tools where I classified the buildings, uh, classify overlap, classify noise, and then classify by height. Uh, for the sake of the demo, I'll go ahead and just uh, show the results here. So what we usually get when we're done through that, um, when we're done with that workflow or that process is something that looks like this. So now we have the uh, points in red represent uh, buildings or structures. Uh, the points in green represent um, uh, vegetation. And then, of course, the brown points represent the uh, the ground surface layer. And uh, with these uh, different points, we can start uh, performing some very interesting analytical uh, capabilities here. So first of all, we can just simply query. So if I just want to see the ground surface, I can see the ground. If I want to see everything above the ground, I can do that. And if I want to see all of them, I can, can go back to that. Um, I can also change the different symbologies like I showed earlier. And then from there, we can generate other types of products that may be used in our analysis, including um, contours and DSMs and DTMs like we showed earlier. So we'll just let that quick process. And so once uh, that's complete, uh, we can then take that information and then web enable it. And so let me show you the results of a project that we did for a county in uh, Virginia. Um, this is a little web application and the uh, panel on the left shows the workflow that I just showed when you have classified data. The panel in the middle shows the workflow that I showed with unclassified data. And the panel on the right shows a workflow that was contracted out to um, a vendor to actually do heads up digitizing of the data. And so as I kind of move around and compare the three, you can see I get very similar results um, no matter what workflow or process that, um, that you choose to, to, to go through. And another part of the workflow that's built into this is extracting out the 3D content uh, from the building footprint layer. So with the building footprint layer as an input and the height of the points from the point cloud, we can now view that in 3D. And so here's the entire county of Fakir. And so I'll just slide through some of the bookmarks. 
And so over the web, we can view that 3D content, um, the building structure, as well as the point cloud that you're seeing here. And we'll go ahead and zoom in. It even captures the different uh, pitches on the roof and the different uh, shapes or what we call roof forms. In addition to that, we can see uh, the number of floors of the building, and those are highlighted by those gray lines there. So we're able to capture a lot of valuable information that we can use beyond just the building footprint layer. And I'll show a couple more here. And it also captures um, buildings that are not rec rectangular. So in this case, um, we've captured some of the round uh, buildings. And then finally, beyond just building structures, we can all classify uh, bridges um, that go above and below ground. And that's going to conclude my demo for uh, the LiDAR feature extraction. And Mark, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to you. OK, thank you, Mark. So we're going to uh, take another moment here and uh, give you the opportunity to answer another poll question. Uh, so you should see under your poll questions there. Um, the question is, how does your organization obtain building footprints today? Uh, perhaps you're getting it from heads up digitizing. Uh, or uh, automated feature extraction from imagery, or maybe you're getting it from automated feature extraction from LiDAR point clouds, as we saw Mark showing, uh, or perhaps you're sourcing it from another organization, uh, or you can choose that you're not currently doing this or you're not sure. So um, we've got some of you voting now. Uh, please just go ahead and tick any of the boxes that apply. Uh, so it could be multiple ones. And uh, continuing to get more uh, votes in here. So we'll give you a few more seconds. Uh, looks like we're up to about two thirds of you again voting. Uh, we'll give you another second there. And all right, we'll go ahead and close it out. And what we see is um, about half of you are not currently uh, uh, using these techniques. Um, about 20% are doing uh, heads up digitizing from imagery. Um, and actually, I missed one here. And about 30% of you are sourcing it from another organization. So. Um, Thanks for that. We appreciate the feedback on that. And hopefully that gave you a little bit of insight into how these um, uh, processes that we're talking about uh, might be able to help your organization. So the imagery capabilities that we've seen today are part of the ArcGIS platform, which enables you to provide your data as services, uh, allowing access across your enterprise to your users on apps and devices that they choose to use. We want you to know that Esri is committed to supporting the development of authoritative statistical data with GIS. Uh, this includes methodology, including a new book to be published later this year by Esri Press on GIS and the 2020 census. This book speaks to the methods and best practices today for applying GIS to your work. There's also hands-on learning with exercises on learn.arcgis.com to help you with capacity building. And of course, the technology that we've discussed today. This technology is now available to many eligible organizations in a new official statistics modernization program announced by ESRI earlier this year. There's more than 75 qualifying countries. Each eligible country's statistical office will receive four years of perpetual licenses of ArcGIS technology. You can contact us on the survey at the end of this webinar to get more information about this. So this has been the, before we go to our question and answer period, I just want to mention this has been the second in our webinar series on making census 2020 count with GIS. You can look at the website at the lower right here to register for another webinar that's coming up October 3rd on the SDGs and dissemination. You can also view recordings of this webinar and previous webinars on this site. So now we're going to invite you to ask any questions that you may have. You can put those into uh, the questions window and um, look forward to any questions that you might uh, provide. We've got some uh, coming in here. So um, one of them is um, you talked about doing feature extraction in uh, ArcGIS Pro. Is it possible to do this in ArcMap as well? Um, Mark, would you like to, to answer that? Yes, every tool that I uh, showed for image classification is also available on ArcMap. The only difference 
is that ArcGIS Pro contains the wizard and the user interface to step through, whereas ArcMap does not contain that, but all the uh, the raster functions and the geoprocessing tools are available in ArcMap as well. All right, thank you, Mark. We have um, we have another question. Um, let's see. First, how how do you examine evaluation of classification results that are already conducted? And the second question is. Uh, there uh, is there any country or national statistical office that is using imagery classification as a boundary and enumeration maps? And if yes, what are the best practices? So, um, Linda, I think I'll give you those questions. Thanks, Mark. And I'm actually going to uh, rely on Mark Romero to help me out with the first part of the question. Um, so there are really two parts there. Uh, uh, with regard to other statistical offices using imagery classification, the answer is yes, certainly there are many actually. Uh, and there are some best practice guides. Uh, uh, Mark had referenced the book earlier. There will be some case studies and examples published in that book uh, with best practices on how to do that image uh, classification and use that in enumeration area mapping. Mark Romero, do you want to take the first part of that question? Yeah, so I think the first part of the question was about uh, performing an accuracy assessment of your results. Um, and I, I, I hope that's what the question was about. But so the, the answer to that question is yes. Part of the wizard, and I didn't get to uh, show the full, um, all the steps in the wizard, but at the very end is the accuracy assessment. And so if you've ground truth um, and collected um, Field, field information, um, and confirm that um, you know the the material or or the object that you're classifying is indeed that. So all those uh, layers can be input into the accuracy assessment. So that includes an existing raster layer, a ground truth GPS point layer, or any kind of like vector or raster based layer that can be uh, used as the input. And then what it creates is a confusion matrix and gives you uh, an approximate approximate percentage of your your total accuracy. All right, thank you, Mark. So another question from Adam is, um, uh, have you done any machine learning analysis on these various images? It looks like this problem could be a great candidate to automate and classify using machine learning. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Mark, do you want to do you want to take that? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's kind of a long answer. I'll try, I'll try to make it as fast as possible. So Esri is uh, uh, fully involved, um, heads deep in deep learning and image, you know, image classification, deep learning techniques beyond what uh, what I showed today. And so um, what we've enabled uh, the software to do is tap into some existing deep learning libraries. So there's a variety of them. TensorFlow is one of them by Google. Um, CNTK is another one by uh, by Microsoft. Um, there's a long list of these deep learning uh, libraries, open source libraries that are out there. And so we've provided a bridge or an integration from Pro to these libraries that allow you to uh, perform deep learning image classification that way. Um, one other uh, thing I will mention is we have a partnership with uh, Microsoft which allows a user to basically spin up an Azure environment that's optimized for deep learning. Um, these are uh, very powerful GPU machines. All of the uh, popular deep learning libraries are uh, deployed on this machine, as well as an instance of ArcGIS Pro uh, with all the integration tools. So it makes getting up and running with the deep learning workflow uh, fairly easy. And so I will go ahead and leave it at that, I mean, unfortunately, we didn't really show any of the deep learning examples today, but um, yeah, definitely keep an eye out. Um, and if you go to Geo, GeoNet, which is our um, collaborative uh, platform for uh, customers, uh, there's a lot of information on there as well on what we're doing. Thank you, Mark. And I anticipate in our national mapping webinar series that we are going to be doing one early next year on machine learning and uh, deep learning with, uh, with uh, imagery and, and AI. So you can look for that. 
So we've got another question here on, um, will training opportunities be made available to national statistical offices to assist with developing and building capacity with GIS uh, technologies? Linda, I'll give that to you. Yeah, great question. Thanks. Uh, indeed, we, we do have training available. Um, ESRI training has many different types of training in online, in classroom. Uh, there's a lot of free coursework at learnarcgis.com. Um, but specifically, we are working to put together uh, statistical uh, one-week seminars that focus on the workflows uh, that your organization organizations do. Uh, the first one of those will occur in the uh, Caribbean region uh, in the fourth quarter this year. We're planning already uh, the first one in Africa in Q1 of next year. So if you have specific questions and are interested to know, um, just let us know that and we'll get you connected and, and let you know where those workshops are being held. Okay, thank you, Linda. We have another training question also, uh, and Mark, you may be able to take this one. Does Esri provide specific training for image interpretation and classification using the raster functions in ArcGIS Pro? Yeah, there's uh, a few resources or places you can go. Uh, the easiest um, and you know free available to anyone is learn.arcgis.com. That's learn.arcgis.com, and we are constantly updating that site with uh, new lessons and uh, workflows and all aspects of our software. Uh, but there's uh, quite a few for uh, imagery and LIDAR and also working with 3D content as well. Uh, the other place is, of course, um, our educational services group. And they do uh, both live training seminars, they do instructor-led courses, and they do online, uh, online instructor-led uh, courses. And so Again, um, there's also a variety of, uh, there's actually a dedicated course for um, image classification. So I would say if that's what your interest is, that's a, a good place to start. And and that's very in-depth. So you, you get an instructor and you're doing like three, uh, three days of online learning. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, we've also got a question uh, going back to the, the link here. Um, if they want to show the URLs, um, the, this is the URLs for the webinar series that you can see um, uh, video recordings of previous webinars. You can register for the next upcoming uh, webinar. There's also a question about the book. Uh, I don't have the, the uh, URL there, but in the survey, you can respond back at the end of this and ask about the book, and we'll send you the, um, uh, the information uh, on that. Um, and Mark, we, uh, yes. just to... To weigh in, the pre-release chapter of the book is available, and we'll share that link with all the participants in the call. Okay, very good. Thank you, Linda. We've got another question here, and I think, um, Linda, I think we'll have you take this one. So how does ArcGIS work with computer-assisted web interviewer? Yeah, great, great question. So um, the RTS platform uh, allows you to do a multi-mode survey if you choose to. In the past, as you know, everyone was on paper. We've moved to CAPI and now a CAWI, uh, the Computer Assisted Web Interview uh, Modes. Uh, really, it's just dependent upon how you configure your database and having the, the data go to the database. The Survey123 tool will allow you to configure uh, your questions and use that in a CAPI mode or in a CAWI mode. So uh, very possible, again, if you have specific questions on that, um, you know, let us know directly and we'll have someone connect with you. Okay, great. Thanks, Linda. All right, and we have, um, and that, uh, let's see, we have, a, that was Kendra that asked that question. So we've got a question from, uh, Aaron Moselli, uh, where will the training be held in the Caribbean? Yeah, good question. Yeah, good question. Not sure yet. We're working with uh, CATACOM and OECS uh, on that now and uh, trying to determine a location. So as soon as we know, we'll, we'll uh, post that information out. All right. And if you have any other questions, we've got another minute or so here that we can uh, we could probably take one more question. And uh... Mark, there was one question about the, the, the census and um, being able to review their uh, data in the office. Yes. 
Uh, let's see, that was, um, you, you talked about the U.S. Census doing change detection in office. Can you tell us how much they were able to identify? Yeah, that's, that's a great question as well. As we understand that the U.S. Census was able to to review approximately 70% of all the blocks in the U.S. in office, uh, eliminating a lot of costly field work as, as so many of those were resolved in the office. The Providence example that Mark showed, um, over 87% of the blocks were resolved in office. So, so you know, that will vary uh, region to region, location to location, but that's an extremely high percentage that were ruled out, you know, just saving a ton of money in the field. Okay, thank you, Linda. And we've got uh, time for, we've got a couple more questions that come in. We'll try and answer some of those uh, afterward. I'll take one, one last question here. There's uh, someone, uh, let's see, Emilio would like some information about equipment uh, to do recognition. How much does it cost in dollars? Uh, Mark, I don't know if you wanna, I think it's, I don't think we can get specifics, but maybe you can give a, a sense of what type of equipment is needed. I mean, this was not high-end um, servers that you, were, that you were doing this processing on. Well, all, uh, all my demos were done on a on a laptop, so it gives you a sense of um, you don't you don't need a powerful machine to go through the out of the box capabilities. Um, and I would say even beyond that, unless you're doing deep learning um, over an entire country, you know, then at that point you would probably need some sort of GPU machine, um, either in the cloud or um, you know, on-premise powerful workstations. So I, it's so hard to give a dollar figure on that. Um, I would say the if you're if you're curious to see how much the GPU machines cost, um, Amazon, AWS, and Azure have a nice little cost builder, and it'll give you an idea of what these things cost to run per hour. And the GPU machines tend to be a little more expensive than um, you know the CPU machines, but um, the other thing to note is if it's a cloud deployment, you're not always, you don't have to pay for the machines when they're not running. So um, many of our customers just uh, turn them on when they're processing and then turn them off when they're done. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mark. All right. Well, I think we've got, um, I, I, well, I mentioned, I think we'll take one more question here. Uh, is there free imagery with good resolution for the Caribbean region? Uh, Linda, you want to answer that and then we'll close out. Uh, sure. Survey, yeah. Sure, there's a few things to consider. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of imagery across the, the region. Um, Within the ESRI platform, uh, within ArcGIS Online, uh, we have resources such as Landsat, uh, Clarity, which is coming from Digital Globe. I would look at all of those first. Those are free to ESRI users. Uh, Sentinel-2 also has some great free imagery available. I can tell you in the Caribbean region specifically, um, during the 2010 round, Inegi had helped fund many of the countries with um, uh, imagery. So you need that historic imagery to do comparison. That imagery is all also available and again if that's something you're interested in I would check in with CARICOM uh, because they uh, have access to that data. All right thanks Linda and thanks to all of you for joining us on this webinar um, and uh, your time today. Please take a minute to complete the survey. It'll just take a minute or two and uh, there's opportunities to, uh, to uh, specific, specify if there's information that you would like to get more, uh, more um, from any of us on. So thank you for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.